close your eyes and focus on the breath. Take a few deep, long in and out breaths and see how it feels. Notice where you feel it. What kind of sensations do you have in the body when, the, when you breathe in? What kind do you have when you breathe out? Where do you feel the breathing? We're not talking just about the air coming in and out through the nose, but it's the flow of energy in the body, which you can feel anywhere. But try to notice where it's most pronounced, where it's easiest to follow. And then notice if it's comfortable. If it's not, you can change. If it is comfortable, stay breathing the same way you are. But if it's not comfortable, you can make it longer or shorter, deeper or more shallow, heavier or lighter, faster or slower. Experiment for a while to see how different kinds of breathing feel for the body. And you may notice that the body's needs will change over time, so that what feels good right now may not feel good in another five minutes. So try to keep on top of how the breathing feels. If you have trouble sticking with the breath, use a meditation word to go along with it. We often use the word butto, which means awake. That's the quality of mind you're trying to develop, a mind that's awake, that's alert. So think but with the in-breath, toe with the out, but toe, until you find that you can stay with the breath, and then you can put the meditation word aside and just be purely with the sensation of the breathing. The trick is to stay, because the mind has this tendency to wander. That's what the word samsara means, is wandering on. It's not so much a place as an activity, something the mind keeps doing. It's peeks in and looks around here for a while, and then drops that and goes over and looks over in that corner over there. If you were to make a map of wh where your mind has been in the course of the day, you'd see it's all over the place. You look like the thread in a sewing machine when everything gets all tangled. And that's a real shame, because the mind is the most important thing in your life. It's what determines what you're going to do, what you're going to say, and what you're going to think. It determines the pleasure and pain that you experience in life. And for most of it, it's, it's totally out of control. You make up your mind, and in the morning you're going to do X, and then you go around and do not X, or anti-X. Then you ask yourself, why? Well, you forgot. Or you realize that there were other intentions that came in, that kind of barged into the mind. It's like you have more than one mind in there. And in a way you do. Lots of different desires, all of which are aimed at happiness. But a lot of them are misinformed. You think you gain happiness from wealth. Well, you try that for a while. Well, Wealth has its problems. Try status. That has its problems. Try popularity. That has its problems. So you go back to wealth again. Maybe it wasn't so bad after all. We keep going back and forth like this. Lots of different desires, lots of different senses of even who you are based on those desires. The Buddha's basic solution to all this is to tell you how to train your mind. If your mind had one set way of being and one set way of doing things, it couldn't train itself. But fortunately, because you have all those different senses of you in there, each of which is based around a desire, one of yourselves can train another one of yourselves. It can see things that another self didn't see. And this is how the mind can train itself. It 
because you look at your sense of who you are, and it changes from activity to activity. Sometimes your body is relevant, and the body becomes you. And because you have a sense of control over it, you can identify with it. You tell it to move its arm, and it moves the arm. Move the leg, and it moves the leg. For the time being, at least, it works. But there are other activities where the body is not so relevant. It's more purely an internal issue. Then you drop any sense of identification with the body, and you start identifying with different factors in the mind. And so your sense of who you are depends on what you have to control in order to get the happiness you want. It also depends on who you think is going to be experiencing that happiness, which part of you is going to be experiencing the pleasure of those different activities. So for each desire for happiness, there's a you who can work on it and a you who's going to experience it. If you watch your mind long enough, you find that there are lots of different desires for happiness and lots of different senses of you. The Buddha calls this I-making and my-making. You create your sense of I for a particular desire. And my, the things that you're going to gain, or the things you're going to be able to control to get that desire. And then either you gain it, and that's the end of the issue. Well, then you discover the when you gained it, it wasn't all that great to begin with. Or you don't, and so you drop that desire and try to find another one. And it's just no wonder that the mind is such a mass of confusion, because there's so many people in there. It's like a huge committee with lots of different agendas. So what we're trying to do as we meditate is find which members of the committee are most skillful. In other words, actually do have the ability to bring about some happiness, and happiness that doesn't have any bad side effects. And if your happiness involves the suffering of other people, there's going to be a lot of problems down the line. So you want to ask yourself, what kind of happiness would not cause other people to suffer? Well, it is possible to develop a sense of well-being purely from developing your inner resources. That's what we're doing as we meditate. We try to develop our mindfulness, our alertness, concentration, discernment, our sensitivity, what's really going on in the mind. So we can train all the members of the committee to see what, where true happiness lies and what you can do to gain it. Because this is one thing all the members of the committee have in common, is they all want happiness. And some of the members may be more difficult to train than the others, but it's not impossible. As long as you realize that the mind is the big factor in life, and if it's going to find any happiness, it's got to be trained. That's one of the basic principles of wisdom. The Buddha said that's what distinguishes a wise person from a fool. The fool doesn't see any need to train the mind. The fool looks for happiness outside. The wise person realizes you've got to train the mind so that it doesn't sabotage its own happiness. And so we start with really basic qualities. Mindfulness means the ability to keep something in mind, like you're trying to keep the breath in mind right now. You're trying to remember each time you breathe in, stay with the breath. Each time you breathe out, stay with the breath. And you try to remember to do it skillfully. Now you find a way of breathing that feels really good. And then you develop your alertness, the ability to see what you're actually doing and the results you're actually getting. Are you staying with the breath? When you focus through the breath, does it feel good, or are you focusing in a way that confines the breath, makes it ill at ease? You can try to change your focus. That's what a third quality is the Buddha calls ardency. In other words, you're trying to do this skillfully. If you notice that something's not working, well, what can you do to make it work? Sometimes you focus too strongly on one spot, and that 
creates tension there, creates pressure there, and that's unpleasant. So you want to back off a bit, but not so much that you lose the breath. In the classical images of a person trying to hold a baby chick in the hand. If you hold it too tight, the chick dies. If you hold it too loosely, it flies away. So you've got to hold it just right. And your sense of just right is something you have to develop over time. But as you work with this, trying to be mindful, trying to be alert, and trying to do this as skillfully as you can, you begin to notice things, and it does become a skill. These qualities of mind become stronger. So your unskillful mental states, the unskillful desires that could slip in when there was a lapse of mindfulness or where there's a lapse of alertness, have fewer and fewer places where they can slip in. You can see them clearly. That, oh, that desire really doesn't create any happiness. It's something I may like, but you look at the long-term results and I really don't want that after all. Now, it's one thing to see that, and the second thing is actually to learn how to drop the desire. This is why we work on developing a sense of ease and well-being with the breath, so we have a better pleasure to compare. Because for most of us, we do things that we know are unskillful simply because we want that quick hit of a little bit of pleasure right now. Well, learning how to focus on the breath in a way that's comfortable allows you to withstand some of those desires. You realize, I've got something better here right now. It feels good just breathing in, feels good breathing out. Try to think of that sense of ease spreading throughout the body. Think of the breath, not just as I said, not just the air coming in out of the lungs, but the energy flow in the body. And so when the energy flow feels good, think of it moving around in different parts of the body, working through any patterns of tension you may have in your arms, in your shoulders, in your back, in your legs, in any part of your face or your neck. Then you find after a while that feels really good just sitting here breathing. It's a sense of pleasure that's free. You don't have to spend any money to gain this pleasure. And it's totally harmless. You're not harming anybody. And it's totally yours. Nobody else is going to kind of move in and push you out of the way to watch your breath. Your breath is your breath. So it's a sense of pleasure that doesn't involve any conflict, doesn't involve any harm. And as you get more and more used to it, it begins to seep deeper and deeper inside. So it really is gratifying. Then when the thought comes that you might want to do something based on greed, aversion, and delusion, you say, well, why bother? Needless suffering. Why bother with it? You've got something better. This is how you train the mind. You develop good qualities, and you also develop a, a sense of well-being that can sustain you. So the various unskillful members of the committee start getting converted. They begin to realize this really is good. Learning how to develop this sense of well-being inside simply by sitting here breathing. And you see that the qualities of mind that you develop can be used in other areas as well. The more mindful you are, the more alert you are the easier it is to do other things in life. Make up your mind that you've got a specific job you've got to do, and it's a lot easier to stick with it all the way through to the end, and to do it well, to do it skillfully. So there are many advantages to training the mind like this. You find it makes all the difference in the world. Everything you do and say and think has an impact on how you experience the world. And if you can train your actions in this way, the world will seem very different. You cause less suffering for yourself and less suffering for others as well. Because the stronger you are inside, 
the less you have to lean on other people, the less you have to impose on other people, the less you create burdens for other people. So it's not like working on your mind is a selfish activity. You're working on things that other people can't touch. They can't reach in. You may have had this experience. You're with somebody who's really suffering, and yet you can't really reach into them to help them. It's a very strong sense of helplessness that comes when you realize this other person is suffering in a way that I can't touch. You see a baby crying, and no matter what you do, the baby just keeps on crying and crying. Or you see an old person who's demented. You can't reach that person. Well, each of us has that inner area that nobody else can reach. And what you're doing as you're training the mind is you're training that part of yourself so it can care for itself. You notice that phrase we had in the chant just now, may all living beings look after themselves with ease. May I look after myself with ease. It's good for all people to learn how to manage this really deep inner area of themselves. When you've got that as something you can really handle, that, you, that you've mastered, then there's really no suffering deep down inside. And when there's no suffering deep down inside, you're not a burden to yourself, you're not a burden to other people. So in this way, the meditation is a gift. You're taking care of the area where you really are responsible. That's another part of the Buddha's basic definition of wisdom, is that you take care of the area that you really are responsible for, and you don't drop that to go meddling in other people's affairs or things that you're, where you're not really responsible. This fact that we have the ability to create suffering inside or have the ability to create happiness inside, and the fact that we use that ability to create so much suffering, that's our problem. That's something we have to work on. Once you've solved that problem, you've solved all the other problems that you're responsible for. Then you have energy left over to help other people, to be at least, at the very least, a good example of them, to give them advice so they can work on their inner responsibilities too. So see this as your most important task, realizing that all the different senses of you that you may have aim at happiness, and yet so many of them end up causing suffering. You want to do something about that, and you do something about that by training the mind, so that all the disparate members of your committee start working together in a way that really does lead to the happiness that you want, that all of them want. And that's how you stop creating problems and stop suffering from problems. So it's a simple activity, staying here with the breath, but it has a lot of ramifications. This is training the most important part of your life. To be wise, to be skillful. To find a happiness that's really true. 